The Late Morning Program with Nam Ras Podcast. Hare Krishna, everyone. You are listening to the Late Morning Program with Nam Ras, the number one Hare Krishna podcast in the world. I'm here, very honored, uh, as with a third time, Maharaj, with uh, Swami Padmanabh. Maharaj, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for inviting me again, Nam Ras. Yes, so, um, th- so this is the last of the... You could say the um, series of uh, podcasts on this topic of bhakti's inherency. Is it inherent or uh, inherited? Uh, so today's podcast will be in context of Sundar Gopal Prabhu's uh, presentation that he did on September 18th. And I would like to read... We, we, we asked uh, Sundar Gopal Prabhu to join. He uh, politely declined uh, for various reasons, which I understand. But I'd like to, he, he actually gave me something to read out uh, before we start. So with your permission, Maharaj, I'll, I'll read that if you want to say anything before that. Or should I read that? Yes, go on. Okay. So this is from Sundar Gopal Prabhu. Dandavat Pranam. On September 18th, I gave a presentation entitled Bhakti and the Nature of the Soul. I wanted to share some interesting new findings on Srila Bhakti and Otakur sources. This was a presentation I had scheduled early in the year with the aim of showing how Thakur Bhaktivinoda's teachings on the ontology of the self were not his own innovation, but come from a long and respected Shastric commentarial tradition. In the weeks leading up to September 18th, following my interview on the late morning program, I received many emails and had numerous discussions on the ontology of the self. Some of these conversations were very helpful and deepening and deepened my understanding. Others, I felt, showed an open disregard even an antagonism towards Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Srila Prabhupada and their teachings. As a result, on September 18th, I began my presentation by sharing in a heartfelt way various arguments and claims that I personally find disturbing, even painful. My intention was not to single out any individual or to launch a personal campaign against anyone. While clearly I addressed some arguments of Padmanabh Swami's, for example, the framing of the debate in the in a dichotomous way. Other points were not connected to him. For example, the claim by some that Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Srila Prabhupada were just plainly mistaken. With hindsight, I should have made this clear and I apologize for the shortcoming in my presentation. My reason for declining to appear on the late morning program a second time is that I have come to see that social media is not a good forum for this topic. I would prefer not to discuss the controversy in public any further, especially not until I have completed my research. That said, I have read a few of Padmanabh Swami's recently published essays in which he names me personally as the Purva Pakshi. I have great appreciation for Padmanabh Swami as a Vaishnava and as a scholar. At the same time, I am not convinced by his reasoning. In his recent essays, he often misrepresents my position, makes significant, verifiable errors, and indulges in unfair personal attacks and, in, and insinuations. I have been considering writing a detailed response, but I would prefer to avoid this, if possible. I will simply devolve into, sorry, it will simply devolve into an endless, recursive, valueless tit for tat. Life is short. The world is divided enough already. Also, I am still at an early stage of my research and I have so much to learn. I'm currently considering the exact direction of my project as I take it forward. In future, I would like to focus on topics that unite us rather than divide us. I would also like to focus on my own personal practice and study. With this in mind, I offer my Dandavat Pranam to all of you and ask you to please direct your kindness towards me. Maharaj, please, uh, any reactions, response? Well, basically, to begin with, I appreciate uh, Sundar Gopal's words and of course I while I will personally prefer sincerely him to be here with us and have a, a much uh, bigger conversation than only with you which is of course a pleasure but I will have liked to have, have him also but of course I totally uh, understand his point and I respect his reasons not to be here with us today um, and I was uh, although in that connection I politely have a different outlook to why 
I mean, for the same reasons he chose, he has chosen not to participate. I would say I have chosen to participate. So it also shows a little bit how us two are approaching this situation from slightly different angles and well, part of the diversity of life. For example, he said, said at the end that he wanted to focus on his on topics that inspire us and unite us instead of dividing us. So somehow I, I understand that he considers that coming here and speaking in this platform may promote that division. Well, for me personally, it's exactly the opposite for me to have sober uh, conversations, which I'm trying to engage in with all of you uh, on things that we know that we need to harmonize, that they are clearly uh, begging for some harmony. Uh, in, as a community, as a as Gaudia community, actually promotes unity. Hmm? And right. of course, we also can get together and speak on many things we agree on, and that's beautiful as well. <laughs> but I will say that it's similarly important or crucial, or maybe even more in some cases, to also have the capacity of dialogue on those things that we may differ. Hmm? And, and also Sundar Gopal is saying that he was he prefers to focus on his own study and learning. And again, for me, actually, this type of meetings and this type of exchanges are part of my study and learning. I hope to learn from this and hope to increase my the depth of my studies on this. Also, he said that he prefers to focus on his practice, and I totally support that. But in my personal case, at least for me, this type of conversations are part of my practice, are part of my sadhana, which revolves around Shravanan, Kirtanam, Harikata, uh, which means for me, Sadhu Sangha, as Krishna defines it in the Gita, Bodhayanta, uh, Varashparam, Katayanta, Shtamamitya, Antusyanti, Charamanti, So right. nourishing each other, enlightening each other, and trying to put Krishna in the center. So, in this sense, I politely may differ with Sundar Gopal's outlook in that sense. And I personally consider this type of dialogue, you may like to call it healthy controversy, as I tried to explain that in, in our first meeting. Right. Uh, as something that is tightly connected to my sadhana, my study, my learning, and tightly connected to those things that have the potential of uniting us as a community. And so some brief words I want to share in, in complement to Sundar Gopal's uh, words. Sure, sure. So since today's presentation is based on Sundar Gopal's Prabhu's points, mm -hmm. uh, could you kind of recap uh, the points that he shared in relation to your first presentation? Okay, so I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible, but he shared a good number of, of points, so I'll try to, to address them. So to begin with the title of the talk, Bhakti in the Jeeva Inherent or Inherited, of course, is the title of my forthcoming book, but also it's a similar title to the title of Sundar Gopal's presentation, because I repeated, if you will, the title since I, since I personally feel that he did not fully comprehensively prove that actually Bhakti is inherent in the jiva, nor I feel he really addressed uh, in a deep way any of the, my main points in my presentation in that connection. And of course, I did not include the subtitle that he chose to include, Defending the Legacy of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, but nonetheless, I'm, I'll try to do that in the sense I'm trying also in my case to defend the legacy of the Thakur. I totally agree with him in, in, in that we have to defend that legacy. But personally, I don't feel that defending the legacy of the Thakur implies like defending it from someone else who may be attacking it. While actually, personally, I feel that protecting or defending the legacy mostly has to do not, not so much as with pointing some, uh, at some possible people that may be attacking or threatening the Sampradaya, but mostly protecting it uh, and addressing that legacy by ourselves studying it, understanding it, and learning how to accommodate whatever thing that has to be accommodated as a result of studying it. So that's my uh, humble, hopefully, attempt here uh, while addressing this important point of our Siddhanta, whether Bhakti is inherent or not in the Jiva. So my plan, original plan, was to address Sundar Gopal's point that he was presented in the paper he announced to share, with, but eventually, for certain reasons, that paper was not shared. So I will mostly um, base myself on what he said in, in the episode with you. And he also made a second presentation similar to that one. So I will take from that. And of course, this lecture will be in, in, in Sundar Gopal, some words like a snapshot of elements that I will include in my forthcoming book, uh, as well as a series of articles that have been published already a month ago in harmonist.us. 
if devotees would like to check them, uh, they are connect. They are you. You will see them are connected with Jamatri Muni's stance regarding whether Bhakti is inherent or not. So four of them have been published. Four more will be published in the next month, once every Monday. So, of course, I'm totally sure that the intention of Sundar Gopal is to honor and to protect the legacy of our Acharyas. And really, I pay my pranam to him because of that. And also, of course, needless to say, that's also my intention. And each one of us maybe is doing that from slightly different vantage points according to their inspiration or nature and, and guidance. But I will say that also Siddhanta is beyond uh, having good intention. Mm-hmm. And, and, and from that side is that I'm trying to share some points about what our Gaudiya Siddhanta is saying in reply to, to Sundar Gopal's points. So interestingly, in the context of this conversation, I've been also speaking with different uh, God brothers of Sundar Gopal's, the disciples of his own guru. And interestingly, many of them have different opinions of the topic. So there is not a consensual stance in, 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 the, in the disciples of Sundar Gopal's guru in connection to what they hear personally from the Guru Dev. So that's an interesting point that we see that there, there's need for harmonization in so many directions. Not criticizing anything, just pointing to an objective need, basically. So in his presentation, of course, Sundar Gopal did not mention my name at every single moment, especially in the second talk he gave, he didn't mention my name at all, I think. But I will say that it was pretty clear that this was mostly directed to me. And there are many, he gave most, most of the examples and language as analogies he mentioned were directed towards me, like the stork story or nature versus nurture, inherit and, inherit and so on. You know? Many things that I used in my original articles on the topic. So I will try to address those points with some conviction, with some strength, but also I pray to remain hopefully humble and in a well-wishing spirit, trying to not engage in personal issues or Vaishnava apparat, what to speak, God forbid, and not taking anything as in personal terms, but in the spirit of Bhat, this proper conversation. And of course, again, I'm grateful to Sundar Gopal's presentation because his own points helped me to develop even more my own presentation. And of course, it's my my desire and my hope that my points may somehow nourish his own presentation. He himself suggested that. If you have any points to will that will nourish my presentation, they are welcome. So here's something they go. I want to yeah, <laughs> something I want to add before you start, Maharaja. It, it's yeah. interesting. I found it very interesting that somehow uh, your presentation was inspiring to some devotees and disturbing to some devotees. Like um I find that very fascinating. The way th- perspectives uh, mm-hmm. devotees can look at a certain uh, presentation and take it in a certain way. That's it's very interesting to me why that was the case. Anyway, you don't have to answer that if you yeah, want to. Go into I think words. <laughs> yeah, I would say that each case is individual. No, I, of course I'm not. I, it's not about well. The more numbers we get, the more correct we are in our each point and so on. So, I, I mean, some people yeah. may be inspired with my presentation by the wrong reasons also, or some people may criticize Sundar Gopal's presentation for the wrong reasons as well, no? or the opposite, any other possibility of that. So right. to be in favor of something or criticize something doesn't mean that one is doing that from the proper side, basically. Hmm? So for example, I see many people who has criticized me saying, all those things that you are saying, you learn from the Babajis. No? Like if being a Babaji will be a bad thing to begin with, that's another conversation. <laughs> how far how, how altering the parampara are Babajis, no? Gorky showed right. no, that. <laughs> right. And it was funny because they tell, no, I, I was not schooled by any Babaji on the topic, but interestingly, I spoke with Sundar Gopal personally, and he told me that he studied the Sandaras with Satinara, under Satinara and Babaji. So interestingly, some people may criticize me claiming something, well, Actually, Sundar Gopal was doing that on one level, which I'm not saying that was wrong at all. But my point is sometimes people is criticizing someone for the wrong reasons, glorifying others for the wrong reasons. Yeah. For example, one near close god brother of Sundar Gopal, when when he spoke about the, the type of exchange we were having, and he said he this is a fascinating exchange of ideas that are making me grow as much as the topic is being churned. So he mm-hmm. expressed this like total fascination with how this were, was unfolding, but others were feeling this is unnecessary, this is disturbing to my faith, or even this is offensive. Or Divi- divisive. 
So my point is all this, you see how many diversity of opinions are there. And this clearly yeah. speaks not so much about what we are saying or our intention, but where each person is in their own inner standing. So that's not speaking so much about nor me, nor Sundar Gopal in one sense. No, So that's, yes, an interesting. And also um, I'd like to add, if anyone's listening to this who, who, um, who may be disturbed or just turn it off. There's this is not for everyone. This, this conversation is not for any, any, everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, no, please, Marge, con continue. Yeah, Thanks for clarifying that nobody's forced to remain connected online. So it's our choice. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it's exactly. our choice to, to follow my points, to follow Sundar Gupal's points. So please do not make any of us responsible of how you choose to feel yourself, basically. Right. <laughs> so mostly Sundar Gupal's uh, four main points regarding my presentation that I will try to unpack today. I will share them now. He himself sent these four points to me by in private message some time ago. So the first one, he said that the teaching uh, by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, that Prem is the nature of the Jiva, is contrary to Siddhanta and opposed to the teachings of Srila Jiva Goswami. Basically, he, he claimed that I implied that. <clears throat> but actually, I've never written that. I never say that as he basically say that to me, uh, I never say that the idea of Prem being the nature of the Jiva is contrary to Siddhanta and opposed to Jiva Goswami. I never use the term uh, contrary to Siddhanta in connection to nature of the Jiva, but in connection to the idea of Prema being inherent, which is a different thing than saying the nature of the Jiva. So I will try to unpack later. I'm just mentioning now the points very briefly. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I remember also when you were asking uh, Sundar Gopal, in, in your episode, you say, who is saying that Bhakti Thakur is presenting Alpha Siddhanta? And of course, Sundar Gopal clearly mentioned a book is, is, has come out saying that. And he said, Padmanava Swami is saying, it's not Siddhanta. So it's against the Siddhanta that's presented by Jiva Goswami. So if something is against Siddhanta, he said, that's called Alpha Siddhanta. So my point is that, again, I've never said this is against the Siddhanta of Jiva Goswami. I never use those terms. I've only said, that apparently you know, what Bhakti Thakur says seems otherwise. And basically I'm trying to show how Bhakti Thakur is actually aligned with Jiva Goswami. And, and for me, Apa Siddhanta also means not knowing the Siddhanta. But for me, using Apa Siddhanta while knowing the Siddhanta for some other purpose belongs to a whole different category that sometimes we may call it preaching strategy or whatever, however you may like to call it. And, and even Sundar Gopal accepted in his discourse at that at times Acharyas can resort to preaching strategies. So how he will call that? Apa Siddhanta in that case, I, I, I don't know. We can ask him for sure. So then his second point was that whatever Srila Prabhupada and Bhakti Not Thakur, I'm reading literally what he sent to me, whatever Srila Prabhupada, that I say, whatever Srila Prabhupada and Bhakti Not Thakur have explained on this topic is not Siddhanta. Again, I've never used the term whatever. No? And we should understand that it is a preaching strategy or transcendental fraud whose shelf life has expired. So as I will try to explain today, uh, although I spoke in terms of preaching strategy in my first episode with you, I've opened myself to other possibilities in that, in, in, as to why they have said what they have said. Although the sedant on the topic remains the same for me. And even if this is not a preaching strategy, it's again, as I mentioned, other aspects of, 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 of the presentation, as, as Sundar Gopal also accepted, is uh, to suggest that, that it may have been a preaching strategy, even if it was not, but it may be in other cases, it's not necessarily minimizing the position of our acharyas, basically. So a third point that he mentioned was, the writings of Srila Bhakti Not Thakur that I mentioned, he quoted, the writings of Bhakti Not Thakur and Srila Prabhupada are riddled with internal contradictions. He mentioned that I mentioned that. Again, if you go through my articles, anywhere in my articles I use that expression or I say those exact words. Again, as much as I have spoken of apparent contradictions, which is very different, while always assuming that our more contemporary acharyas from Bhakti Not Thakur on indeed knew the Siddhanta, and that is precisely the reason why I've tried to explain what they say, basically. And the last point that he mentioned to me was that I say that Srila Bhaktinot Thakur's and Srila Prabhupada's statements on this topic find no support in Shastra and tradition. So again, I've never mentioned that directly. 
I with all respect consider Sundar Gopal's postulate in this connection in con incomplete and out of context, which lands, of course, in that way to misinterpretation. Hmm? What I've said is that Srila Prabhupada and Bhaktivinoda Thakur have said both same things. It is inherent, it is not. They have not said only one thing. So Srila Sundar Gopal seems to convey the notion that I'm talking about everything they say as not supported by Shastra. So that creates in Sundar Gopal some words, a false dichotomy, basically. No? So this will be the four main points that's, that Sundar Gopal shared about my presentation. Uh, for those of you who just joined, I it seems like we're just talking about Sundar Gopal Prabhu like he he under, he knows that we are doing this podcast and he also he also gave a um at the beginning of this podcast we read out a statement from him of why he wasn't joining uh and and so we read that so for, there's a lot of devotees joining now about 60 devotees who are watching right now so if you if you just joined we we are we are discussing the points of Sundar Gopal Prabhu and he actually uh gave a statement beforehand so please maharaj continue well, basically that to begin with, no, in connection to what Sundar Gopal said. Right. So what's your what's your view on his main thesis then? Okay. So let's go to his main thesis and my view. So in a nutshell, uh, hopefully I'm not misinterpreting that, hope. The central argument of Sundar Gopal suggests uh, that Jamatri Muni, who is a well-known Acharya from the Sri Sampradaya, he's the ultimate authority, for, according to Sundar Gopal, on Jiva Tattva for Srila Jiva Goswami. And since uh, Jamatri Muni or Manavalaba Muni seems to propose that Bhakti is inherent and Bhakti Notakur is seen to closely follow Jamatri Muni, Sundar Gopal concludes that therefore Bhakti Notakur must be totally following Srila Jiva Goswami, who must be also following the doctrine of Jamatri Muni because he's apparently his main authority in Jiva Tattva. But as I've uh, already mentioned in another talks also, but also he, this one, if we engage in some Siddhantic debate, if you will, with some Gaudiya, or to speak of people from other Sampradaya, with some Gaudiya, but some Gaudiya maybe from outside the Bhaktivinoda Parivar, just in case we members of Bhaktivinoda Parivar are, are not the only Gaudiyas in the universe. <laughs> so if we engage in debate or talk on this topic with someone else, or we are simply presenting Gaudiya Siddhanta, not the Siddhanta of the Bhaktinot Thakur, of the Bhaktinot Parabar. We are presenting what Gaudiya Siddhanta is. We should be ready to establish our points without resorting to the, the, the writings of our own Acharyas, but to resorting to a consensual mutual canon, scriptural canon, which is for us Srimad Bhagavatam and the books of the Goswamis. So we should be, be able to de demonst demonstrate that bhakti is not inherent or that it is inherent, whatever the case, without the urge of quoting Bhakti Notakur or any of our present acharyas. And this won't be an, like an offensive dismissal of them, but actually the proper etiquette to deal with other people, with other lineages, as well with our own lineage, uh, respecting their particular sources of inspiration and scriptural authority and going to our mutual common scriptural authorities. But I don't feel that Sundar Gopal has done that. He's not taking main shelter in the consensual Gaudiya canon as his main uh, praman or evidence, but instead he specially bases his presentation on the statements of Jamatri Muni, who is a member of another Sampradaya, which is basically a form of a heterodox system, which somehow attempts to justify whatever the Bhagavatam says on the Goswami says, and not vice versa, going first to the Goswami grant on the Bhagavatam. But some so, would say that's some would say that's uh, jumping over our acharyas, and they have issue with that. Yeah, yeah, I, we will speak about that okay, later. You will. I will okay. take hold <laughs> this point first. But yeah, sure, yeah sure, that, sure. that's in mind yeah. to share. Of course, that's a valid claim for sure. So, of course, for me, with all respect, but Sundar Gopal's findings were promoted as groundbreaking, and and, and and it was mentioned that he has uncovered very rare texts referring to those of Jamatri Muni that may change the course of history in Gaudiya Vedanta and so on. But for me, at least under close scrutiny, this is not the case at all. Jamatri Muni's writings were not only already well known in our own in his own Sampradaya, but also were quite acknowledged in the larger Vaishnava community. So those texts were available to the Gaudiya Sampradaya for centuries, basically, but its members have totally ignored them, basically, apart from this quote from Jiva Goswami, for sure. And now we will go there. But why, after Jiva Goswami 
there was not this referring to Jamatri Muni and Jamatri Muni because Jiva Goswami already informed us all we need to know about Jamatri Muni and his teachings. <laughs> and as we will see, Srila Jiva Goswami's quoting of, of, of Jamatri Muni is basically, as someone said in one Facebook thread, utilitarian and context specific. And why, why I'm saying that? Because to begin with, Jamatri Muni belongs to another Sampradaya with a different, different Sampradaya means a different Sambanda, different Abhideya, and therefore different Prayojan. And so the conception of Priti or Prem, the moon is, Jamatri speaks in terms of Priti, they, their conception cannot be the same conception as the Gaudias because we are a different Sampradaya with a different goal of Prem and Priti. Actually, most of the Sri Vaishnavas, when they refer to their goal, most, mostly speak in terms not of Priti, but of Moksha or Mukti or devotional deliverance. So even if we want to speak in terms of Priti regarding the ultimate goal of the Sri Sampradaya, their notion of Priti will be totally different from the Gaudiya notion of Priti. Because for us Gaudias, Priti or Prem considers all forms of liberation inferior, even devotional liberation in Vaikuntha, in comparison to the very unique type of Prem that the Gaudiya Sampradaya is giving. And Jiva Goswami clearly described that type of Priti in a whole treatise he dedicated to that called Priti Sandarbha. And you can go, for example, to Anuchedas 1 and 59 of Priti Sandarbha, and very clearly he establishes there how Priti or Prem is not inherent. Also, Rupa Goswami defined Priti hmm, in our Sampradaya when he says Prem, Prem or Priti is a Bhakti Rasamrita in the one for one, just in case you would like to see those quotes. So he says Pre Prem is a condensation of Bhava. And when he describes what is Bhav in 1117, he says, Bhava is Sudurlava, or very difficult to attain. So needless to say, if you are if something is difficult to attain, it's not with you, it's not inside of you. <laughs> and that applies to bhava. If bhava is very difficult to attain and prem is a condensation of bhava, how much difficult to attain is prem? How much less inherent if you <laughs> no? So so, how, so how could something so difficult to attain be at the same time inherent in the jiva? But Sundar Gopal insists that Srila Jiva Goswami in this context, accepted Jamatri Muni as the ultimate authority regarding Jiva Tattva. And he concludes this mostly by how Srila Jiva Goswami refers to Jamatri Muni in Paramatma Sandarva 19, when he refers to Jamatri Muni as a very, very senior teacher of the Sri Sampradaya in the line of Sri Ramanuja, which is, of course, a very remarkable praise. Uh, that's very clear and that posits him as an authority on Jiva Tattva. But this is not tantamount or not the same to Jiva Goswami's accepting the matrimony as his own authority or ultimate authority in Jiva Tattva. He's an authority on Jiva Tattva, but not necessarily ultimate thought or authority on Jiva Tattva. For Jiva Goswami, who are the highest authorities? Again, Srila Rupa Goswami, hmm, Srimad Bhagavatam, hmm, and so on. He himself established that in his Tattva Sandarbha, the ultimate scriptural authorities, the Bhagavatam and the books of the Goswamis, his seniors, and so on. And in all these treatises, we find that Bhakti or Priti or Prem is not inherent. And in this, one more thing, if possible, in this same Anucheda, Anucheda 19 of Paramatma Sandarbha, Jiva Goswami quotes Jamatri Muni's list of 21 qualities of the Jiva. But interestingly enough, nowhere in the explanation of Jiva Goswami of these qualities, which is through Anuchedas 20 to 37, uh, Jiva Swami even remotely suggests hmm, that bhakti or priti is inherent in the Jiva in any form. So the point is, if Jiva Goswami will be in favor of inherence, why his opinion was not then clearly broadcasted throughout uh, his writings and especially his sandarbhas, or at least in this specific section when this list is mentioned. No? So some, some ideas to begin with. <laughs> wow, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a technical. Um, yeah. So I understand that you say that bhakti is not inherent. Uh, and then Sundar Gopal Prabhu said that it is inherent, but also I think in his presentation, he said it's not as well. Did he say both? I can't remember, but he did he say both things? I, w I yeah. wish anyway. Yeah. Do you have this, anything to say about about that? <clears throat> yeah, actually, Sundar Gopal in his first talk, the one he had with you, Mostly he said Bhakti is inherent or Prem is inherent. He did not mention too much the idea of, 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 of the other option as well simultaneously. Now, this was said in, in, 
in his second lecture, and where he emphasized a little bit more this idea that his bhakti is inherent and it is not at the same time. Hmm? So, and the context in, in which he presented that, he mentioned this idea of teleological inheritance. So he said, what Jiva Goswami and Bhakti Nautaku are speaking about is not either physical inheritance hmm, with shared locus, nor etiological inheritance, but teleological inheritance. No? So he spoke, described that in terms of telos, which is an ultimate aim or inherent purpose that is already established, but waiting to be attained. He gave the example of a, just as a mango seed has its purpose to become a mango tree. In this way, every jiva has an inherent purpose and ultimate aim, and so on. Right. So he explains he explained that this is the case because the jivas feel complete fulfillment in prem. So this is what the jivas are constructed for. And in this context, he says their final attainment is already predetermined. So I'd like to unpack a little bit the implications of this statements and sorry all the audience if, if this sounds too technical but the topic in itself is quite technical yeah. but this will be the last episode on that next ones will be much more smooth and <laughs> user friendly <laughs> so <laughs> so to begin with uh the fact that a jiva may experience the highest limits of happiness in prem does not mean that prem is indeed inherent even teleologically of course what does teleologically prem, mean in, in lay terms. Teleologically means that uh, that's the highest goal you are destined to attain, basically. You are predestined to attain that particular goal, and unless you reach that goal, you won't feel full satisfaction in that okay. particular situation. So it's not inside of you, but pre it's predestined and it's waiting for you, and, when I, and only when you reach that, you find full, to total fulfillment, something like that. So, of course, I totally agree that Prem is the highest possible reach for any Jiva, according to our Gaudiya theology. That's, of course, the Siddhanta. But this does not mean that, uh, how to say, subjectively speaking, other inferior attainments may not be experienced as the highest fulfillment for some Tatasta Jivas. In other words, some Jivas will attain Prem and will find total fulfillment there. But some other jivas will not attain prem, will not attain some lesser form of realization and will experience total fulfillment there. For example, Sundar Gopal mentioned that in prem, the jiva will feel there is nothing more to be attained. So one will, one will not experience that if prem will be merely a capacity. No? He mentions that. But actually we can give examples that counteract that. For example, as I spoke in my second episode with you, some jivas may attain Brahma Sayuja or Sayuja Mukti, which is merging into Brahman, basically. And the experience of those jivas who enter there is total fulfillment. And that's why they remain there forever and they do not fall from there. We already explained that for those who may have an issue on that, they can go to the second episode. But the point is you can attain Brahma Sayuja for eternity, no fall from there because there are no gunas, no maya shakti, but there's no prem either. So you are in an eternal situation without prem. Or beyond Brahman, you can attain by kuntha in Santa Rasa, passive adoration. And it is said that Santa Rasa does not include prem, interestingly, because one of the main qualities of prem, as Rupa Goswami describes, is mamata, which means possessiveness in relation to Krishna, to a particular relationship. And, one, and the, one of the main qualities of Santa Rasa, Rupa Goswami says, is nirmamata, lack of that possessiveness, interestingly. So it's another way of saying lack of prem. Mm -hmm. So you can attain even by kuntha in some situations without the need of prem. And again, that's a permanent position. That's eternal. And the person finds total fulfillment there without prem. So in that sense, we can dismiss this argument of teleological inheritance. But... Even, let's say, if, if nonetheless we are that those jivas in Brahma, Sayuj, and Santa Rasa, some may say, they also have some in teleological inherent prem, then how do we explain that even if they have this teleological prem, they are able to remain in an eternal situation, whether in Brahman or in Vaikuntha, which does not require prem? Hmm? Because these two attainments, Santa Rasa and Vaikuntha, Brahma, Sayuja, they are totally devoid of Maya Shakti, 
So what happens to that supposed teleological inherent prem in those cases? Where that where is that? Is latent waiting where or something? Where does such prema remain at that point? And what does that why does it not come to the surface when they are in that situation since there is no more influence of the gunas in Brahman or in Vaikuntha? So for these reasons and others, when Bhakti Nautakur and Jiva Goswami speak about Prem in terms of the highest attainment of bliss for the Atma, actually they are speaking in objective terms. Objectively speaking, this is the highest attainment possibly, possibly conceived. Yes, this is the ultimate goal of Gaudiya Vedanta. This is the highest potential for bliss in it, for a Tatasta Jiva in connection with Prem. But again, this notion does not convey the idea that Prem is teleologically inherent. Mm. Indeed, I will say that if, if a Jiva will have uh, some form of inherent Bhakti, interestingly, we could say the reali- when, when the Jiva realizes the Atman, the Atma realizes itself, Atma, Atmananda, you know, the, the, the bliss of the Atma will include realization of Bhakti or Bhakti Ananda. Because if Bhakti is inherent in the Atma, whenever you realize the Atma, you realize Bhakti there. But over and over again, we find in Shastra that there's a clear difference between the Atmananda and the Bhaktiananda realization. And it's clearly established the hierarchy and how inferior Atmananda is in comparison to Bhaktiananda, which shows that Bhakti is not in the composition of the Jiva. And also, if I may continue, the case for this teleological inherence implies uh, the problematic notion that uh, although we not, do not have inherent physical bhav, Sundar Gopal mentioned each jiva is predestined towards a particular bhav. So I would like to analyze this point. You know, that someone may say, yes, every one of us is already like hardwired, you say in English, like predestined hardwired, yeah. towards a particular bhav. To begin with, this contradicts Rupa Goswami's famous statement in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 2538. Uh, when he mentions that the bhava that each devotee pursues pursues is derived from their respective bhakti samskars obtained in sadhu sangha. In other words, according to the association you have, you receive certain impressions that make you be inclined toward, towards a particular bhava. So it's, it's clearly showing it's not predetermined. It comes through sangha. And there are many other verses in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu for that. You can see 1, 2, 14, one two two hundred twenty nine one three fifty four and so on. So our, I, I want so to our, talk with many quotations. Right, but our position, like our, um, is swarup the right word? Swarup is a tricky word. Can mean many things. So let let's leave that for a moment. But swarup means one's own form, or swarup can be nature, many things. But yeah, it's possible to use that word if you want. Now in this case, so. Our sarup is is not predetermined, but it is, uh, mm. it, it is gained or it is. Um, <laughs> you, the language is really you have to be careful what language you use because it can be either you know. Yeah. So you're saying, I just want to reflect back to you what you're saying. So you're saying the sarup is um, gained through sadhu sangha the way. Mm-hmm. If we understand Swarup as one's intrinsic identity, spiritual identity, spiritual identity, okay, mm-hmm. but it is it is gained through association. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, I'm not saying that that's saved by Rupa Goswami. I'm just repeating what he's saying. Let let me share, for example, what Jiva Goswami says on that matter. I will just sure, quote sure. quote Bhakti Sandarbha Anucheda two hundred two. So I give a summary of that section brief. He says. For me, this is pretty clear, hopefully for you as well. Let's see. He says, by association with devotees of a given disposition, one develops a corresponding type of faith in Bhagavan and a relish for hearing about him. Then, by further association with those particular devotees, one develops an attraction for the specific manifestation of Bhagavan, who is the supreme object of those devotees' worship, as well for, for the specific path of worship that those devotees follow. So for me, that's totally clear. He very clearly saying by certain association, you develop a corresponding faith and inclination to worship Bhagavan in a certain way, according to those devote, how those devotees are doing that. So <clears throat> I, I just want to say one thing. I just want to say one thing. Like yeah. if that, for example, if someone, I know a devotee who joined ISKCON 
and he became Iskand devotee many years. And then he became, uh, and then he was attracted by Pushti Marg. So then he became uh, a, a devotee, very much a practitioner there. So if it is predetermined, like you're is something, then how does that work? If if you change, you have to ask. You have to ask those who. Do you have to ask that to those who propose that idea? That's right. not my proposal. <laughs> right. I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to yeah, illustrate yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Or it could be that someone um, becomes a Sri Vaishnava or so, you know, it's so it many has, yeah, yeah, many yeah. examples. Yeah. And also, another problem with this predestined idea of, of, in the Jiva is that uh, we, I think we spoke that at one point, is that it makes the whole of Mahaprabhu's indiscriminate dispensation something exclusive limited and even elitist because you will you will if you say certain jivas are predestined to a certain type of prem and what mahaprabhu came to give is very specific of course it's very undiscriminate as we will see but points in a certain direction so if you say only certain jivas are destined for that actually you are making the whole of mahaprabhu's campaign something limited because if the specific type of prem that every jiva is supposedly destined to attain has already been predetermined, then Mahaprabhu's gift to the world is basically reser reserved only for those who inherently match with the love he came to give. Mm. And Sundar, yeah. Gopal actually, Sundar Gopal confirmed this in, in one of his episodes. He said basically that same thing. But actually Shastra is exactly says the opposite, refers to Mahaprabhu's gifts in very different terms. So I will share some brief quote, quotes in this connection which show how what Mahaprabhu came to give was given to each and everyone without discrimination and not only to those who were made for receiving that. So let's go, for example, see Chaitanya Charitamrita 1723. It says, in distributing love of Godhead, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his associates did not consider who was a fit candidate and who was not nor where such distribution should nor where such distribution should or should not take place they may no conditions so then chaitanya charitamrita 1929 says not considering who asked for it and who did not nor who was fit and who unfit to receive it chaitanya mahaprabhu distributed the fruit of devotional service so again this shows that was given to everyone and anyone and if this applies with Mahaprabhu, what to speak then to Nityananda Prabhu, whose campaign is even more undiscriminated. <laughs> and let me finish with one purpose by Srila Prabhupada to one of, of, of this very one of the verses of Chaitanya Charitamrita. He in this connection, Prabhupada says, This is the sum of substance of Lord Chaitanya Sankirtan movement. There is no distinction made between those who are fit and those who are not fit to hear or take part in the Sankirtan movement. So my point is, if you say, no, no, only those who are made predetermined for that are the ones who will receive that, that's totally against the principle of Mahaprabhu Sankirtan movement. Rupa Goswami, in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, when he describes Sadhana Bhakti and who is fit to engage in Sadhana Bhakti, and in, in this specific Sadhana Bhakti that came in our Sampradaya, he uses the word Sarva Dikaritam. Which means everyone, Sarva, Adhikaritam, everyone has the Adhikar for engaging. In, in other words, everyone can participate in this. He's not saying only those who had this predetermined inclination and so on. No? And actually, I remember you, Namras, asked Sundar Gopal in your episode uh, about this. You say how we can explain inherence and Mahaprabhu's indiscriminate dispensation at the same time. Mm. And Sundar Gopal basically said that Mahaprabhu freely bestowed Prem. But what makes that bestowal so special, he said, and valuable for the jiva, he said, is precisely that it is a bestowal that accords with the jiva's very nature. So basically saying, for me, that's not very, how, how free, that bestowal is not very free, basically, no? because it's only limited to the inclination of a jiva. So he's basically saying, what's, what's special is what Mahaprabhu is given is only for those who are made for that. But I will argue that what makes Mahaprabhu's gift special is not that it accords with the jiva's nature, but that it, that it is being freely given <laughs> to each and everyone without discrimination. Exactly the opposite. Hmm? So indeed, for me, what Sundar Gopal is saying is, is like a gentle way of actually saying that Mahaprabhu belongs, again, to an elitist group who gives something exclusively 
to those inherently hardwired for such a gift. And personally, there's nothing special about that for me. And let me go with, if, if it's possible, one more sure. point and problem with this teleological point, uh, because it compromises Bhagavan's own position, because it makes him partial. If I say makes him partial, because if you say that certain jivas are made for Madhurya Rasa, there are Madhurya Rasas, Tatasta Jivas inherently, the problem of inequality will come. Because if some some Staibabs, some Rasas, afford more intimacy than others, so objectively are higher than others. So if God made Jivas who can experience something objectively higher than others, God will be partial by making Jivas that are, that are unequal in terms of the prospect, of their prospect. And again, if Prem is the highest attainment, but Bhagavan designs only some specific jivas to attain Prem, because we mentioned some jivas will go to Brahman or Santa Vras, and they are not experiencing Prem. So does it mean that Krishna made them without the potential to attain Prem? So all this will represent a very delicate fault in, in Bhagavan himself. And, and, and interestingly, not only our Goswamis are mentioning this, but I would like to almost close this with a quote from Bhaktivinoda Thakur himself, who very conclusively mentions how Prem is not inherent in any way, but is transmitted from heart to heart, from one Vaishnava to other. So this is something, an article he wrote called Pratishtasa Paribarjana. And this article was written in the year 19, uh, 1896 which according to Sundar Gopal was the year the teleology, the, theology, theological zenith of Bhaktivinoda Thakur's writing when he also mm -hmm. wrote Jaiva Dharma. So in that inspired year, the Thakur says in the article as follows, when our hearts are clean, a ray from the sun of Prem will enter. This ray, which enrich, enriches our hearts with Prem, comes from the heart of a saintly Vaishnav. This is the only way to attain Prem. It is passed from one Atma to another, just as lightning passes from one cloud to another. Gradually, by associating with Vaishnavs, the Prem in the Vaishnava's heart is naturally transmitted to the heart of the Jiva. So for me, wow. that's pretty conclusive. And I have searched the original Bengali. I have the words for each term, so it's not just a matter of... Can Wrong you repeat where that is exactly? Because I know devotees are like, where is that? Where did he read that from? Yeah, I have even the link because the article is presented in one link. It's one article called Pratistasa Paribarjana from the year 1896. Uh, I think there is one. The website is called Bhaktivinoda Institute, if I'm not mistaken. If not, if someone wants the exact link, I can share that. In sure, the yeah, well, we can share that. Wow. So basically, the conclusion before going to another topic is that the Prem we will taste depends on the prem we associate with. There's no inherence, no nor physical, nor etiological, nor even teleological. Mm -hmm. And uh, can I share some words regarding the concept of Swarup Shakti in this connection, Namrasa? Briefly. Uh, yes, I, I do have a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, it, like, are you, are you making the... Is it sanat? Is bhakti, prem, and swarup? Because we use all these different terms when we're discussing this topic. With all diff different devotees, different you use different terms. So are these all like synonymous? Can be interchangeable? Swarup, bhakti, uh, prem. Not necessarily. Now, if we okay. want to speak in specifically, they refer to different things. A devotee may have bhakti, and doesn't mean he had prem. Or you can speak about Swarup and you are not speaking about Prem necessarily. So uh, I see. Okay. Not necessarily. So yeah, I know it's not so easy and, and it requires some technical accuracy. So yeah. okay, yeah. So, and yeah, that was only my question. You can yeah, you can yeah, talk yeah. about Swarup City. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So or some brief words on Swarup Shakti, because Shakti, it's a right. connected topic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when, when Sundar Gopal spoke about Swarup Shakti, he mostly referred to the Sri Sampradaya and not so much to his own sampradaya. And basically he's saying that in that connection, say a Vaishnava is giving Swarup Shakti, but that allows the Jiva to remember or regain their Swarup. He expressed himself in those terms, which actually is a very noble notion for us Gaudias, which is never presented by the Goswamis, remember our Swarup or regain our Swarup. 
but it's something mostly borrowed from the Sin Sampradaya and somehow superimposed into the Gaudiya Sampradaya. So similarly, when he was asked about how to harmonize, I think you asked him in, in your episode, how we can harmonize the bestowal of Swarup Shakti with the inheritance of Bhakti. Because he mentioned we need Swarup Shakti to be bestowed on us, but he said also Bhakti is inherent. So how to harmonize that? And Sundar Gupal basically said to you, I, I will not comment on that topic since I have not come across a detailed discussion of Swarup Shakti in the writings of Jamatri Muni. So I cannot comment, comment on that. Right. So my point here is that while Jamatri Muni may have not shared a detailed description of Swarup Shakti, we don't, our Gaudi Acharyas did, definitely did. So we are to turn to them for the definitive answers regarding Swarup Shakti instead of waiting for the Sri Sampradaya's opinion on that matter, basically. And what did the Goswami say in regarding the Swarup Shakti? They say Bhakti is the essence of the Swarup Shakti. Swarup Shakti is made of Sandini, Sambit, and Ladini. And these three are not inherent in the Jiva. Therefore, Bhakti is not inherent in the Jiva. And interestingly, one more thing, Sundar Gopal declares that, that he accepts that Bhakti is the essence of the Swarup Shakti. But if this is so, uh, how can we say, how can he say that Bhakti is inherent and by this not imply that the Swarup Shakti is also inherent because Bhakti is the essence of that. And similarly, he has said that Prem or Priti is a function of, of the Swarup Shakti. And, and he says, but Swarup Shakti is bestowed. And, but he says Jiva has some form of inherent priti, but he could not say whether the Jiva had sort of shakti in its constitution. So if we, but the point is, if we distinguish between priti and sort of shakti, then we are following a different definition of priti than the one given by Jiva Goswami. And, and when some questions were presented to him in this connection, Sundar Gopal said, basically, I do not have a wholly worked out theological solution that connects everything. I have not done that work. So no need to comment on that. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> should we should we go on to? Do you want to yeah, say yeah, anything yeah. more? Okay. Um, isn't isn't it that Sundar Gopal Baru's approach show is showing more deference? It's like those who say, okay, it is inherent. Isn't it showing more deference to Bhakti Vinod Thakur because he said that it is? Um, isn't it more in line with how our Acharyas? Um, who who generally show deference to the previous acharyas when there's contradictory st statements? Well, to begin with, Bhakti Nautakur said different things, as we already mentioned. Right. And, and for me, of course, I totally agree that we have to show deference to Bhakti Nautakur, but how we do that, for me, to show deference to Bhakti Nautakur uh, is to show him aligned with Srila Jiva Goswami. And of course, I, I, I know that Sundar Gopal wants to show that. I mean, it, it, that's our in, the intention of both of, of us. Right. But my point is, if two statements result problematic when they are being absolutized simultaneously, like, for example, the idea of Bhakti is inherent and Bhakti is not being inherent, and you try to absolutize the two at the same time, as I showed above, that's not possible. That creates lots of problems, this idea of teleological inherence. So bhakti cannot be both inherent and inherited, as we mentioned. So when that happens, in that case, we need to resort to our Goswami's conclusions, which were really consensual, unanimous in this direction, in the connection of bhakti not being inherent. And we are to understand our more contemporary acharyas accordingly, because our acharyas told us, study the books of the Goswamis. So we go to the books of the Goswamis and we have, we need to deal with whatever we find there, basically. Right. I, I, I would think that uh, if Bhakti Imano mm -hmm. Thakur was here with us and we told him, I mean, I don't want to say that, but, 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 but that if, if it presented to him, oh, you said two things on two different occasions. Oh, but then there's the checks and balances, Shadu, uh, Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. So if there's to balance things out, like you said, if there's two apps, if you're making absolute statements and they're both contradictory, then there has to be a, a way to harmonize that by looking at like the, the wider Shastra canon, right? Yeah, it's like if I say, okay, Srila Prabhupada said we fall from Vaikuntha, and he said nobody falls from Vaikuntha. So if you try to absolutize the two of them at the same time, that creates a problem. Yeah. So yeah. There's, there has to be another way of solving that situation and not just 
insisting on those two things only basically no? so similarly we are trying to do something like so that. then but then the question maharaj comes like did they not mean what they said basically what did 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 he not mean what he said then if there's contradictory statements well basically the point is here we may never know what did did they mean in in, in certain things they say now for example go back to the example proper say at one point, everyone, every jiva falls from Vaikuntha here. At another point, he says, nobody falls from Vaikuntha. And you may ask me, which was Prabhupada's intention when he said this or that? And I, I may tell you, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I was not there. And I may never know. Right. But the fact that I may never know doesn't change the Siddhanta, doesn't change the fact that nobody falls from Vaikuntha. <laughs> so sometimes we get too much into... But did they mean this or they did not mean that? We may not know. We may conjecture about that as we are trying to do as, as hopefully, healthily as yeah. possible. Yeah. But we may never get to the ultimate reason of why did they say what they say on this specific point. But my point is that does not doesn't change what the Goswami said in a very clear and consensual way, which is our Gaudiya Siddhanta. Like, for example, there is a quote by Srila Sridhar Maharaj. And it says, um, our inner self is located there. If our inner self by construction is meant for Raja, then our progress will be like that. Until we reach that realization, we cannot feel any satisfaction anywhere. Gopakumar cannot fully identify himself with the activities of any other plane. If one has one's innate nature in Vaikuntha, then one's journey will terminate in Vaikuntha. One will remain there satisfied. And then he goes on, and then a student asks, how is that one develops this innate nature? Is it developed? Srila Sridhar Maharaj, it is not developed, it is discovered. And then he uh, quotes Kritiv Sadhya, Bhavet Sadhya, that verse. So the question is, it's une uh, unequivocally clear what Sridhar Maharaj is saying here. So is he sastrically wrong, or does his statement lack integrity, or does he not know what he's saying is Siddhanta? Sorry, he's not Siddhanta, but he's saying it anyways. I think your answer, I think your what you said previously answers yeah, we that. Can, yeah, we can add something more if you want, no problem. Please, please, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've read that statement someone sent me some time ago. I think we are speaking about the same statement. So, mm -hmm. to begin with, that's Sila Siddhamara speaking with a, a student, someone. So, we do not know whom to whom Sila Siddhamara was speaking. So it's not in a book or in a public lecture. It's a link in the web, which is okay. I'm not trying to downplay that. But sometimes personal conversation with someone maybe in a particular context with certain emphasis. For example, Sila Simras ends up saying it is not developed. It is discovered. And I could say, well, actually, even if Bhakti is not inherent, when you reach your Swarup or your ultimate identity, the subjective experience may be can very well be defined as it is discovered. Your personal experience, like I'm discovering this, not necessarily because it is inherent. Right. But but if you want to interpret the words of Srila Siddharmaras and unequivocally clear, which for me are not, to be honest, then also you have to harmonize with other of Srila Siddharmaras' statements <laughs> to the contrary, which seem definitive equally. So for example, uh, I, I quoted one in my forthcoming book, in, in, a com in a similar conversation, I have the link of the conversation for those who want. He says more than once this idea. He said, someone may say that in the innermost most existence, we all have connection with Krishna. And he says, but that is not true about the section that comes from the Tatasta Shakti. That means us. Oh. <laughs> he says, the internal potency, Swarup Shakti, is already going on smoothly, eternally in the Surup Shakti. So for me, that's even more unequivocally clear that he's mentioning. So it seems to be contradicted because in the other statement, it seems we have this innermost connection and affinity. And he's saying that is not true about the section coming from the Tatasta Shakti. <laughs> so my point is, again, we have these two things and you have to do something with that, not just emphasize one, but acknowledge whatever has been said and try to harmonize that in the context of what our founding Acharya said. For example, right. Sula Siddhar Maharaj, the main two references there are Gopakumar and this famous verse of 
uh, Bhaktira Samrita Sindhu, which describes sadhana bhakti. Kriti yeah, I want to finish reading that quote just to, before you say that. The name Gopal Kumar hints at his innermost tendency. Sanatana Goswami gave him the name Gopal Kumar to indicate that his innate nature is that of a Gopa, cowboy of Raja. If one's innate nature is that of a Vaikuntha Vasi, a servant of Narayan, then one will go to Vaikuntha and remain satisfied there forever. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Brihad, let's go with Gopal Kumar first. Uh, if you go to Bhaktivedanta, in my in my forthcoming book, I have quoted I think more than one hundred verses from Bhakti Brihad Bhagavatamrita <laughs> that clearly prove how Bhakti and Prem is not inherent. I, of course, I won't torture you quoting them now, <laughs> but if someone wants, I can share with them the list of the verses. So there, it is clearly showed that Gopa Kumar did not have inherent Bhakti, but he received Sakya Bhakti, Sakya Rati, some scars from his guru many sections for example or, or or when he when he realizes his identity in Swarup, i think it's verse 239 gopa kumar then said i then obtained the body beyond the five material elements not for those who say that this spiritual body is inherent or something so in in and in, in the commentary sanatan goswami says the same thing he's paraphrasing gopa kumar who says kalayan the word kalayan means obtained so Gopal Kumar says, I obtain a body beyond the material senses, which again means Bhakti is not inherent, basically. It's obtained. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't want to torture you with many quotes from Brihad Bhagavatamrita. You have to get my book. <laughs> but okay. if for one moment I go to Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, one to two, because actually that verse is one of the main ones which show that Bhakti is not inherent. Kriti Satya Vabet Satya Bhavasya Sadhana Abhida Kriti Nitya Siddhasya Bhavasya Prakatya Mridi Satya which says basically through sadhana, eventually bhava, which is nitya siddha, or eternally perfect and existent, manifests in the heart. So the verse may be dual. Someone may say manifesting from inside, from somewhere else, whatever. But if you go to the purport of that verse, both the purport of Jiva Goswami and uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, they will mention there that bhava, the appearance of bhava, will be accomplished in the future, sadhyata accomplished, by the special actions of the most excellent transformations of the Lord Swarup Shakti, Sambit Anladini. So they are telling that by Sambit Anladini, all this comes. It's not coming from us, but from Sambit Anladini. And Sambit Anladini, of course, are two or the three of the three ingredients of Swarup Shakti. Swarup Shakti right. And Swarup Shakti is a separate energy from Tatasta Shakti. Jiva Goswami quotes Vishnu Purana 1, 1269, both in Krishna Sandarva and Bhagavad Sandarva. Bhagavad Sandarva 99, Krishna Sandarva 186, for those who like to check. A famous verse, he quotes twice, and his verse says, Ladini Sandini Sambit Twayeka, which Dhruva is praying to Bhagavan and said, Ladini Sambini and Sandit Twayeka only are present in you. And Sridhar Swami comments on that verse, and Jiva Goswami quotes him in the Sandarvas. This energy, Swarup Shakti, is present only in you. This potency, however, is not present in the living entity, in the living beings. So my point is these verses that Srila Siyamras is quoting, if you un understand their implications, are proven exactly that Bhakti is not inherent. For example, one more thing, if possible, or two more things. Sure. <laughs> Reflecting sure. on this verse, because it's a very pivotal, important verse, Jiva Goswami, you can go to his commentary on Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 131, and he says, what is the essential nature of Baba? Bhava has as its swarup or as its essence, Krishna's swarup shakti in the form of Ladini and Sambit. And this swarup is an eternal manifestation situated within the eternal associates of Bhagavan. He's not saying it's situated within the hearts of every living being, but this Baba or Prem is in the hearts of the Nitya Parishads of Bhagavan and manifests accordingly in the heart that has been prepared by, by Sadhana, if you will. And in Priti Sandarva 59, one more quote, if you give me permission, mm -hmm. Jiva Goswami says, as it has been stated in this verse of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, 1 to 2, Kriti Sadhi Bhavet Sadhya, Bhava is self existent in Krishna and his pure devotees. From them, it descends into the hearts of some fortunate living beings. Again, that's very different for saying it is present in every living entity or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so if we want to say that what Sri Rasiyar Maharaj said above is unequivocally clear, 
which I do not agree with because of the reasons I mentioned, then we have to, we have that our Goswamis, as I've just quoted, have said even more unequivocally something different, if you will. And they have, and then we have to harmonize that without dismissing the Goswamis who are our founding acharyas. Mm -hmm. And again, as I mentioned before in your previous question, we can do this and we can just conjecture why some of our more contemporary acharyas say what they say at times. We may yeah. never, never know the ultimate reason, but that doesn't change the Siddhanta, which was unanimously established by the Goswamis. Again, Prabhupada say, fall from Vaikuntha, no fall. We may never know his real intention about why he said we fall from Vaikuntha. And but it's the okay. Siddhanta, it's the same. Yeah. And it's okay, yeah, we shouldn't get paranoid or, or Prabhupada was cheating me or my faith is destroyed. No, no, no. So my point is, uh, how to say, there is, and on top of that, even if you may like to say, I disagree with some of the things that some of our previous acharyas said in this connection, there is place for that without you being offensive to them. For example, it's not my case here. I'm trying to harmonize and show how they were aligned with the Goswamis. But for example, Bhakti Notakur. He was initiated in the Dinityananda Paribar with the Bhagnapar Goswami's lineage. And he didn't subscribe to all the ideas of the Bhagnapar Goswamis. The Bhagnapar Goswami had the idea of Rasaraj Gaur, which is close to Gaur Nagar Bhav. They had this notion coming of Nityananda being compared with Sri Radha ontologically, which is a very heterodox idea, come present in Ananga Manjari, Samputika, Bamsi Siksha, Murali Bilas, and books. And Bhakti Thakur did not embrace those ideas. But he never rejected his lineage. He continued to honor that legacy. But he took some distance from certain things. Mm -hmm. So for me, the main question here is not so much to know why Srila Siddhar Maharaj say that in that moment, and they say, may have said something different at other moment. And of course, they, they, the question is not trying to impose those sections and make them our Siddhanta when they oppose what the Goswami said. For me, the real question here is, how we can grow our grow, grow our faith in such a way that that faith won't be disturbed when we are when we are acknowledging that these different statements are there and we may never know why they say those things but despite that siddhanta remains the same so the real question is how i can nourish my faith in that direction basically um, I was reading some online threads on Facebook and there were some devotees were saying, why can't both be even correct? Why can't we say, why can't we accept both things? Why does it have to be black and white? Why isn't there a gray area? I know you're, you're, you're really, I love it the way you explain. There's always a gray, like there's always some gray area and it doesn't, Gaudiya Vaishnavism is, is a hard for, for devotees or people who are kind of fundamentalists, like there needs to be a black and white. Yeah, but of course, gray area can be there, but not necessarily in the form of everything can be possible because it's, 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 if I like, to, if, if I say to you, why the Jiva must be eternal and cannot be simultaneously non-eternal? Why the two cannot be true? They cannot be true. I mean, one, like cancels the other basically when right. light is there darkness is not there we acknowledge is there ignorance is not there so it's not that they everything has to be at the same moment at the same time and that's gray area and we are progressive and open-minded and if we say nobody fall from Vaikuntha, you are being fanatical no I mean, it doesn't mean like that siddhanta i mean nobody yeah. if you say nobody fall from Vaikuntha and everyone falls from Vaikuntha, <laughs> you may say that if you want i'm not forbidding you but you have to harmonize all the problems that will come by saying the two things at the same time. So the same with saying Bhakti is inherent and Bhakti is not inherent. I already explained that when I'm speaking about teleological inherence. So we can say in, in gray area, Bhakti is inherent in the form of a potential that the Jiva has to embrace Bhakti according to how it comes by Sadhu Sangha. That's, <laughs> that's my gray area, if you want. <laughs> I love, I love gray, as I told in the first episode. That's my favorite color. So I'm not right, right. But I, in some cases, certain points are in certain way, and we can adjust in sentimental way. Ah, let's embrace everything. Everything is possible. Krishna can fall in Maya if he wants. We can make so much mess in that sense, also. Yeah. the 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 bottom line for me, Maharaj, is that if there are contradictory statements, and there have been by our acharyas. Um, by our 
more contemporary acharyas to to harmonize those there has to be you cannot absolutize each one and try to make an argument for it but you have to look at it where are they get the param like take into account the parampara they're yeah, yeah. coming from a certain lineage so go up a little bit more in lineage they told us to read the books of the goswamis so harmonize it with the goswamis for me that i'm i'm okay with that I'm okay also. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just because stating. Our, our, yeah, where Acharyas are not isolated members, they're part of the whole chain of right. succession. And actually, right. they will be pleased if we see them through the lens of their succession, not that if right. we isolate them and over-glorify them to the point of not caring for their predecessor Acharya. So in order to properly honor them, we have to acknowledge their background and go to that background whenever some of those statements are in, in, in clear need of harmonizing. So that's yeah. in service to them. It's not a dismissal to them, actually. Yeah. I was thinking of Deva Madhava Prabhu's post that he did a few days ago, where he was kind of a similar point that we have to be able to, uh, as followers of Srila Prabhupada, we have to be able to um, understand his points in the context of the larger canon of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, not just absolutizing a certain statement that he might have made. And that's and that's proper glorification. That's that's proper. Um, I mean, he would want us to do that in my, yeah. I would think so. Prabhupada say once, my movement is the movement of Bhakti Not Thakur. Hmm? He right. say, I, I'm not come to bring anything new. I'm just in, like implying I'm part of a whole chain of people. It's not myself coming with my own ideas and my own sampradaya, if you will. Right, so, so right. we shouldn't feel the need to isolate our guru from the rest to make him the best. That's basically mm. a symptom of, of, of Kanishta faith, which may happen. I'm not saying there's bad intention there, but we should know how to deal with those cases also. Mm -hmm. I guess another, so I have, a, you know, some other questions that I've uh, gotten from different devotees and also myself, but like, in 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 pushing, not in pushing, but in writing about bhakti's inherency, is there some agenda that you have when it comes to? <laughs> sorry to say it like this, but this is a question. Do you have, do you have some kind of agenda? Why why is this point such a point that you want to write a six hundred page book about? Uh, it's not that long. You are scaring my my prospective readers by saying. Oh, okay, that it's not six hundred pages. I don't know. Maybe three hundred something, four hundred okay. maximum. Okay, I'm sorry. Or more digestible. Right. And I'm, I actually am not pushing and I want to write the book and I want everyone to believe me or hear me or be convinced by me or anything like that. Right. I mean, you are the one who invited me to speak here. <laughs> to I, begin I, with. I, I, and, and, and my Gurudev and the Vaishnavs were the one at one point who gave blessings and instruction to write on that. So it was not something that I was like conceiving and designing. I will write and I will push. It, it came organically. So I'm trying to to honor that. And I'm trying to worship through this, if you want to speak in terms of agenda or intention, actually. Through this, I'm trying basically to honor, worship all my acharyas with as much intellectual and integrity I, I possess. And, and I really have no plan of attacking the Sampradaya or downplaying any of our acharyas, but actually, hopefully, acting as an objective uh, theologian, which I feel identified with that role with that service coming from my Gurudev, and trying to grasp our, our Gaudiya Siddhanta beyond even my personal devotional affiliation. Even though I have my guru and my lineage, when speaking about Gaudiya Siddhanta, I'm trying to be objective and let's speak about our Sampradaya. And, so I'm, and I'm trying in that context to harmonize those things that came by studying all, all these books, and all the books of Prabhupada and Bhakti Tagore. I've read them all in many times, so... As a result of that study, some things came to the surface. So this is not a new topic, basically, but others have pointed at it also while criticizing some of our acharyas. But I'm not trying to address it in a way that our acharya's integrity is, is protected, being also properly understood in the context of our founding acharyas. And also, as I mentioned in our first episode, um, I consider that the Gaudiya community in general, of course, there are exceptions to the rule, but in general lacks some intellectual integrity, some dynamic thought. So I'm trying hopefully to serve the community by the blessings, instructions of my Guru Maharaj and the Vaishnavs trying to engage in the seva of writing this book. For me, this is a service to this Gaudiya community 
with the hope of promoting some healthy, mature thinking about our own tradition, being critics, critical, critical thinking. And so we as members of the Code of San Prada can go deeper and deeper into the unlimited implications of belonging to this lineage. No? So I'm that's glad my, you, my yeah. Agenda. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you're able to, you know, express that because I think sometimes devotees misunderstand what your intentions are. Yeah, that will happen always. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and quiet knowing which is my real intention in my heart. So I, I go at night with my pillow and can't sleep quietly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, going back to uh, Sundar Gopal Prabhu's points, let's let's go back to that. Um, he he mentioned that we should read Jiva Goswami according to the sources he quotes. Mm -hmm. So, doesn't this mean that Jiva Goswami is actually following Jamatri Muni's notion of inherent bhakti in his presentation? Well, uh, through this idea, what if I have not misunderstood, what Sundar Gopal is suggesting is that while Jiva Goswami may not be following Jamatri Muni's totally in every single thing he said, at least he implies that in those specific cases where Jiva Goswami is quoting Jamatri Muni, we should conclude that he, Jiva Goswami, is in full agreement with Jamatri Muni. And Sundar Gopal also said in that connection that that the sources that Jiva Goswami is, 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 is using need to be understood uh, as parts of Jiva Goswami's explanation. Because he said that he cannot be contradicting the very sources he's using. Mm -hmm. and, and he then added to that, trying to make this point, that Jiva Goswami is glorifying Samatri Muni, he's relying on his teachings, he's using the same terms Jamatri Muni used. So if we say that Jiva Goswami had a bit different view on than Jamatri Muni, then the question comes, Sundar Gopal said that did Jiva Goswami fail to grasp Jamatri Muni or did he uh, deliberately misrepresent him? And he said neither of these options are satisfactory. And I agree that neither of those options are satisfactory, but those are not the only available options. <laughs> so there is place for Jiva Goswami uh, resorting to a particular source, quoting someone in the context of his own presentation of his own topic and that, because that quoting will help in a particular way, it will have a certain structure, a certain language, but doesn't mean that he agrees in total with that person. And that shouldn't be considered like a misrepresentation or a misgrasping, if that word exists at all. <laughs> but a typical way of using others' concepts or lists in the context of one's own exposition of Siddhanta, what I've called in my articles, transcendental borrowing. And interestingly, there is a lot of uh, history uh, and testimonies of that. Our acharyas take in from other authors, but they do not agree with their authors, even in the things that they are borrowing from them. Mm -hmm. Sundar Gopal himself gave one example. He said, Rupa Goswami Supadeshambrita, in big part of the book, comes from one book called Hatha Yoga Pradipika. So the point is, Rupa Goswami is quoting that book. It doesn't mean that he's agreeing with what that book is saying. Or, or Rupa Goswami is taking so much structure from Bharat Muni's Natya Shastra when this presenting his aesthetic theory in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, but he's not accepting the secular doctrine of Bharat Muni. Or Sanatan Goswami is quoting Balavacharya in his Bhagavatam purports. He doesn't follow the Balav Sampradaya Siddhanta. Or Rupa Goswami in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu quotes Pushti Marga and Mariada Mark, which is the name for Raga Nuga and Bhai Bhakti in the Balav Sampradaya. They are not following Balav in every single sense. Or even Jiva Goswami, more extremely, quotes Sankaracharya in, in the Sandarbhas. And he quotes Sankaracharya even more than Jamatri Muni. And not only he quotes Sankaracharya to refute Sankaracharya, but many times he quotes Sankaracharya as a reference. You know? And Sankaracharya, we know, is diametrically opposing his doctrine to Bhakti. Mm -hmm. right. Or, for example, there's one book of Jiva Goswami called Bhakti Rasamrita Sesh that fully, he's fully almost borrowing from one book called Sahitya Darpana from Vishwanath Karviraj, which is also a book of secular aesthetics, not spiritual even. Or Rupa Goswami, his Padyavali, also borrowing here and there. So my point is, as we can clearly see, this methodology of transcendental borrowing does not imply any form of conceptual alignment from the ones who are taken, but exclusively some utilitarian purposes. 
And if you want, I can show one more extreme example coming from Bhakti Notakur himself. Sure. You may have heard there's one book from Bhakti Notakur called Balls and Git. Right. Which, which is a book of songs and, and when in which Bhakti Notakur is borrowing, if you will, <laughs> the Kirtan style of the balls. Yeah. So on one side, Bhakti Notakur is denouncing the balls as an Appa Sampradaya. <laughs> But at the same time, he's gently borrowing from them the structure of their kirtan, not only to convey Gaudiya Siddhanta, but specifically to refute the, the doctrine of the balls. Mm -hmm. And he himself sang the songs, he sang, sang in like Chan Baal. He's, he, he puts a name to his own as a bowl. So imagine, you no know, Bhakti Notagur is transcendentally borrowing, even from an Apa Sampradaya. And of course, he's not subscribing with, to their ideals. So if that can be so done, this can be done much more with a closer Vaishnava lineage like the Sri Sampradayas, as Jiva Goswami did with Jamatri Muni. So, and I remember that when, um, uh, I think you asked or someone asked Sundar Gopal, like if by quoting Jamatri Muni, Jiva Goswami, does it mean that he's taking him as an authority on Jiva Tattva? And Sundar Gopal say, of course he is. He's obvious, obviously posting him as an authority on the topic. If not, there will be no need for the high praise that Jiva Goswami presented. It's a conscious decision, he said. But interestingly, if, if you want to take that as the reason why Jamatri Muni is an authority for Sri Jiva on Jiva Tata because of the praise Jiva presented, Jiva Goswami, for example, regarding Madhvacharya, he not only is quoting Madhvacharya excessively, quote, abundantly, or he even praises Madhavacharya, I will say with even more flattering words than the ones he used to address Jamatri Muni. For example, in his Tattva Sandarbha, Anucheda 28, he says he refers to Madhavacharya as the venerable Madhavacharya, the prolific teacher of the distinct Vaishnava philosophy of Tattva Bad. So again, he's totally glorifying Madhavacharya, but it doesn't mean that Jiva Goswami is following. Madhvacharya in his doctrine or in his Praman uh, approach, which, because Tattva Sandarva, this section is on Praman, and he's glorifying Madhvacharya. It doesn't mean that he's following Madhvacharya's approach to Praman. Mm -hmm. So the same thing we can say that applies with Jamatri Muni concerning the ontology of the, of the Jiva in Paramatma, Paramatma Sandarva. Mm. Okay. Um... And then, uh, and then we talk. Uh, Sundar Gopal would talk about Sheshatva, that that term. Do you want to comment on that term? Okay, that's only one word, but it's a long <laughs> topic. But I'll right. try maybe, to maybe briefly because we have a lot. There, there's a lot of discussion going on in the comment section. Oh. Also, there's some wonderful devotees uh, asking questions. Also, so yeah, let's we see if we'll be able to get there. We have time for them, yeah. So, yeah, in Anucheda 19 of Paramatma Sandarva, 21 qualities of the Jiva mentioned by Jamatri Muni. Jiva Goswami is quoting them. And the last is Sheshatva, uh, which is considered by Jamatri, according to Sundar Gopal, the most important. Uh, Sheshatva, more specifically, is described as Paramatma Ika Sheshatva Shubhav, which basically refers to how the nature of the Jiva is to be understood as an integrated part of Paramatma. It's not speaking about inherent bhakti. And interestingly, before that list, that quality, qualities eight and nine, say that the jivas are ekarupa swarupa bhak. But you know, Tagore translates these qualities in his Dasamola Siksha, chapter six, as in their original identity, all jivas are equal, which is showing they're not specific inner affinity in each of them. They're all equal. Mm -hmm. So these previous qualities contextualize all the ones that come after, including Shesha Atua. And interestingly, when Jiva Goswami explains Shesha Twain, Anucheda 37, which is the only additional section where he speaks about that, he says not anything, nothing about inherent bhakti of any types. He basically translates Paramaitmaika Shesha Twain, the Jiva is by nature an unitary, irreducible remainder of Paramatma. In my articles, I deal with this in further detail for those who will like. So basically what Jiva Goswami is saying here is the, the, establishing the nature of the Tatastha Shakti in connection to Paramatma. The, the Jiva is the inherent energy of Paramatma. It is never divorced from its constitutional nature of being an integrated part of Paramatma, even in the liberated stage. But Jiva is not saying anywhere, Sesatwa means Bhakti. 
So the, the reason for Jiva Goswami not expanding on Shesh Chattwa is a conscious choice. Interestingly, the explanation that Jiva Goswami makes on Shesh Chattwa is four times longer than the second longest definition he makes of any of the reminder, reminding 20 qualities of the Jiva. So if he elaborated in such a detail on Shesh Chattwa, but he never mentioned that he's speaking about inherent bhakti. No? And interestingly, if you ask the question, why Jiva Goswami did not say this clearly, Sundar Gopal said that Jiva Goswami did not mention that Seth Chattwa means inherent bhakti because he expected his readers to know the obvious meaning of Seth Chattwa, which means inherent bhakti according to him. And that needs to be assumed. And this is my firm belief, he said. So again, belief is belief. It's more a conjecture than anything. <laughs> so my point is, if Seth Chattwa is the most important of these qualities, why then Jiva Goswami did not take did take for granted that all of his readers understood its meaning and did not explain that in detail that it means inherent bhakti. If, so, and, and, and interestingly, at one point Sundar Gopal also declared that he won't deny the possibility that Jiva Goswami borrowed the term Sesatwa but interpreted it differently. So they're contradicting himself because he's on, on, on other moments say Sesatwa means inherent bhakti, and then he say I'm open that it may be something else. So even, even if for a moment, just to finish, we may consider Shesatwa somehow proves that bhakti is inherent in the jiva, still we have to harmonize that section of Jiva Goswami with everything else Jiva Goswami say to the contrary, you know, a very robust scriptural evidence to the contrary. Mm -hmm. So some ideas in connection with Shesatwa. No, I don't want to. I can continue, but it's too much. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. Um... I kind of want to talk now a little bit about the social implications of your presentation. Some devotees say that it's disturbing to faith, disturbing to their faith. Do you have anything to comment on that? Well, we already commented something at the beginning, how different people will react to my presentation in very extreme different ways. Yeah. But <clears throat> Again, going yeah, back, we did we did discuss that, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can mention some brief words, of course. Sure. Someone someone told me once, like, but Maharaj, if now, if according to what you said, or what the Goswami said, Prem is not inherent. Is is it, if a devotee is reading, given a class in an Eastern temple, reading Chaitanya Charitamrita, the verse Nitya Sita Krishna Prem, and in the purple Prabhupada is saying that Prem is inherent. So how will we when explain that? And of course, the same applies if you are reading, giving one Bhagavatam class and reading the purple Prabhupada say, we fall from Vaikuntha. And then two weeks later, you are giving class again and reading another verse which says, nobody falls from Vaikuntha. <laughs> and someone will ask you in the class, by Prabhu, two weeks ago, you, you read in the purple and you are in the Vyasa San and you have to reply to them. You cannot just say, I only repeat what Prabhupada says. I mean, that's not very comprehensive. So we have to learn how to solve these conundrums. I mean, this is already lasting for half a century. Prabhupada passed away almost 50 years ago, and still that is not fully solved. <laughs> so wow. one topic is connected to the other. So again, my point with this is, my intention is not to suggest that Bhakti Thakur or Prabhupada didn't know the Siddhanta, to, but to show them as a line with the Goswamis, but in a way that we are not doing away with the Goswamis say so clearly about non-inherence. And if someone feels that what I say is disturbing to their faith, as I mentioned in one of my articles, actually, actually what may be happening is that what I'm saying is challenging to their faith. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we need to be this sacredly disturbed, as I like to put it. And through this exercise, to, to, we are invited to think deeply about revelation, mm -hmm. because if not, we can fall into an area of complacency, complacent faith, kanishta faith. So in these cases, we are need to rethink in, in deeper ways to properly resort, how to resort to revelation, because our faith is to be nourished by Shastra, as I always like to mention. Our faith is to have Shastriya Shraddha. But if by, by, quoting my, by quoting Shastra, someone's faith is disturbed, you follow. You are, you are expected to have Shastriya Shraddha, faith nourished by Shastra. So if I, if I quote Shastra, your faith, your Shraddha is disturbed, <laughs> then that will speak more about your lack of Shastriya Shraddha than right. about the so-called uh, disturbable. Mm -hmm. And and in this connection, uh, I have to mention, unfortunately, Sundar Gopal and Wampon mentioned that we should study the books of our Acharyas instead of trying to demonstrate that the books are full of contradictions. So 
uh, I could perceive the intention basically there that at the point is, I'm not trying to, to show that the books are full of contradictions, but it, the result of the study of studying the books of the of our acharyas is that some of their statements show themselves in clear need of harmonization, as I happened to me when I've read all of their books, then such a healthy exercise has nothing to do with trying to prove they are wrong, trying to prove their books are full of contradictions. Mm -hmm. So that will be basically some, yeah, the healthy statement is another one. So I only spoken in terms, as I said, of apparent contradictions. But unfortunately, again, Sundar Gopal declared that I was creating some false dichotomy by pitting Sri Jiva against Thakur Bhaktivinod and asking the reader to choose between one of the two, saying one is Siddhanta, the other is Abba Siddhanta. But I've never done so. Actually, if I say that, my dear Sundar Gopal is creating a false dichotomy himself because my statements have never put Jiva Goswami engaged against Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Actually, I'm trying to bring them closer by presenting different ways of appreciating the, the Thakur's presentation in alignment with Jiva Goswami's presentation. What about see? What about what Bur Prabhupada says that we need to see the Goswami's works through him? So, for example, even in this verse, Sadhya uh, Kabanoi, that that verse. It's kind of it's quite clear he's saying that it's in, inherent and it just needs to be uh, it's revealed it's it's there it just needs to be revealed. So why can't we take? I mean I know the answers to this, but I'm just saying for the sake of the audience, why can't we just take that as? Uh, Shri, I mean, who's gonna? Not everyone is gonna go to the Goswami's literature and try to read it. Uh, you know, uh, right. you know. Prabhupada is sending you to those books. So if you really, really, really like Prabhupada and read his books, you have to end in the Goswami's books. <laughs> right. But my point but is, for someone yes. who's just someone who's new and some, you know, it's it's clear oh. there, Marat, that it's uh, yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's it's inherent. Someone who's new, as you say, may not be properly had to be watching this episode and dealing with this right. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. But <clears throat> again, I agree. I'm, I'm I'm not against saying okay. You can see, you have to see the Goswami's book through Prabhupada, but <clears throat> if what Prabhupada says, let's go for a minute to another related topic, which is again, fall from Vaikuntha. Prabhupada say we fell from Vaikuntha at times. Yes? But Jiva Goswami writes an entire Anucheda in his Sandarvas explaining we don't fall from Vaikuntha. So how we are supposed to read Jiva Goswami's through the lens of Prabhupada here? You follow how we are supposed to understand the teachings of Jiva Goswami, who is saying nobody fall from Vaikuntha through Prabhupada's teaching, who sometimes says we fall from Vaikuntha, not always. Mm. At that point, we, we are not to think, okay, we ne nobody falls from Vaikuntha till Prabhupada say that. At that moment, some Jivas started to fall from Vaikuntha. You, you cannot say that. So right. we are to approach to the Purva Acharyas through the present Acharya, but not to the point of absurdity, hmm? like in this example I'm giving to you. So similar to this topic. At some point, Prabhupada, in some cases, say clearly Bhakti is inherent or somehow it seems so, at least clearly. But also he says something else. And when you go to the books of the Goswami, they're clearly saying it is not. Hmm? So, and again, in his books, Prabhupada directed us to the books of the Goswamis. And by going there, you find, I mean, that was my process. I didn't begin my studies with, with Satsandarva. I began with Prabhupada's books. <laughs> And in his book, he so many times emphasized go to the Goswami's book that I went there and I found myself in the mess I am in now and <laughs> trying to harmonize all that basically. And, and, and we can study the books of the Goswamis because sometimes they want to say, you have to learn everything through your present acharya. You cannot go directly to the Goswamis. I remember what quote that Srila Narayamara said to one disciple. He said, if I give you the blessings to study the books of the Goswamis, by yourself, you will get much more from your study of those books than from what you are getting from me personally, he said. So there is place for this type of revelation and experience. Mm. Mm. Uh, so, um, yeah, basically that and what to do. And for example, the, the example, another example that contradicts Shastra. Now again, Prabhupada saying fall from Golok or Bhakti Nottakur saying we fall from Tatashta or even in Krishna Samhita, he mentions we fall from Vaikuntha. <laughs> And for example, Sunda Gopal repeatedly says, I accept the concept of anadi, non-fall, beginningless conditioning. But if he accepts anadi, that notion goes against Prabhupada saying, we fall from Golok and Bhaktivinoda Thakur saying, we fall from, from Tatasta. 
Mm. So, and I remember when, when he was asked Sundar Gopal about Bhakti you know, Thakur falling from a Tatasta region, and Sundar Gopal said, I can say that some Vaishnavas say that Bhakti you know, Thakur is just trying to explain it in a way that is simple and not to get too hung up on it. I think this is only one phrase, one sentence in Jaiva Dharma, perhaps found somewhere else, but it's not, not something I have studied. So again, he's, I, I will say he has to study that because it's a quite important connected topic. But he said it's only one word, but he himself is trying to make big part of his presentation only with one word also, which is sesatwa. Mm. And also this is connected, if, if I may, one more idea, with this idea that Gurudev can never say anything wrong, Gurudev can never say anything relative, and everything Guru says has to, everything, whatever anyone else said has to adapt to whatever my Guru says, even the Goswamis. No? So again, if Prabhupada say we fall from Vaikuntha, then we are to read Jiva Goswami in that light. Somehow he must be promoting the fall from Vaikuntha. Or this idea that if Gurudev mispronounces one word, the dictionary must be changed. Right. Well, well actually, I don't agree with that. I mean, I, 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 I do not suggest dictionary must be changed. But, but it doesn't mean that Gurudev became less. But that so-called mistake. That's how it's seen, right? That's how it's seen. Yeah, actually, I know that for some level of faith, that's the idea. Oh, Gurudev is never wrong and the dictionary should be changed. Jai Gurudev. Actually, there was one one, path, one moment with Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He was giving a lecture and there was a discussion about an English dictation of what Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhanta said. And some of his words were not matching the dictionary. Some of his English words were not matching the dictionary. So one of his disciples said, the dictionary should be corrected to suit his word depth words. Right. So many devotees started like to, to glorify that, to applaud that. Jai, Jai Gurudev. But Srila Siddhar Maharaj, who was present there, he didn't agree with that at all. I, I want to share something he said in that connection, literally. He says, regarding that attitude, he said, this is the attitude of a neophyte, the Kanista Adhikari. The higher principle will contemplate what guru will want and correct it so that his position will stand in public. Such correction is not offensive, but service of the highest quality. Hmm? Wow. So wow. I really resonate with that type of, of approach. Although I do not condemn those who may take the other idea, I respect their faith, but there's place for something else. So my point is, despite, despite any so-called mistake, Sri yeah. Guru continues to be honored. But we can point to whatever may be re adjust, required to be adjusted in his service. But that detail is not com compromising his inner standing and hopefully nor our inner standing, ideally. And for me, this represents a much more comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. Bhakti Notakur also, let me share one brief quote of Bhakti sure. Notakur from Vaishnava Ninda. He says, provided one has the right motive, the scriptures have not condemned a careful analysis of someone's faults. Proper motive is of three types, desiring the welfare of the other person, desiring the welfare of the world, and desiring one's own welfare. So we see you know, our own acharyas are giving green light for a healthy and proper criticism, if you will. There is a nice book for those who may like interested from my friend Radha Madhav Prabhu called Perfect Imperfection, on Guru's license to err, that is very much in this connection. So I, that's strongly recommended for those who will like to go deeper into this stuff. That's a this is a it's a, it's a <laughs> yeah, scary yeah. topic to be honest. For me, it's because it's because it's um, it's not for everyone. I understand your it's point. It's not for everyone. Yeah, but I, at I some, can't say at, at some point. Is. At some point of our devotional journey, it becomes a necessity. And if, and if you do not embrace that necessity, your progress may be checked at that point. So at some mm -hmm. point, it may be healthy not to address that. But at some point, it's equally unhealthy not to address that. <laughs> I guess the question is, is does the words of Srila Prabhupada and Bhakti Vinod Thakur hold less weight than that of the six Goswamis? How do we, how do we look at that? Well, I, for me, they hold the same stature and their authority is this has the same weight, should have the same weight for us, or even more in some cases. I'm not saying that. And that's why I'm trying to harmonize their statements. That's why I'm trying to uh, address whatever they say. No? 
because it's, they are so important for us. And if I do not care for them, I will go, oh, they go swimming, say this, bus, end of the testimony. But no, we, are, we want to, to accept whatever they said. But again, that said, Goswami are the founders of the Sampradaya. Bhakti Thakur, Sila Prabhupada, they are not the founders of the Gaudiya Sampradaya. And I'm not criticizing them by saying that. <laughs> I'm just saying the Siddhantic and founding Acharyas of Gaudiya Sampradaya, the Goswami are we are, look to, are we are to look to them for our original Siddhanta, especially when something seems apparently different. And again, this happened to me to give my personal testimony. Because I first studied the books of Prabhupada and Bhakti Thakur, all of them many times, and they point so much to the Goswami. So I went there and I found what I found, and I found that there is some need of reconciliation of, of facts. So but it's basically, not really... yeah, yeah, right. sorry. But it's not really harmonization. It's like, for example, the fall, no fault. Like we, this is an example. This is the example we always give. The you know sometimes Prabhupada said we fell. Some one time he said or he said that we didn't. So. It's not that we're harmonizing that with the Goswamis. It's that there has been a time where he said something that wasn't, it was incorrect. Yeah, I personally do or not take it. Say, or can we just say that we don't know why he said that and just leave it there, right? Uh, that's, that's how I see it. That's what I mentioned. I mean, we, we can conjecture about that. And I, and I have tried right. to do that in my book, actually, as I mentioned before. Although I recognize that in our first meeting, I mostly emphasize the idea they say what they say as a preaching strategy. In time, I continue speaking with other people like Lucian Wong, my Guru Maharaj, and others. And I kind of continue like digesting the whole idea and thinking about other possibilities as to why they may have said what they said. Nonetheless, that remains a form of conjecture because, as you mentioned, we may not even ne never know ultimately why they say what they say. Yeah. But in my book, I have expanded the possibilities to... Okay, what they say is part of their theological unfolding, them being need to see this, but evolving in their lila sadakas like Bhakti Notakur or, or a translational issue, because in the time of Bhakti Notakur, inherence was uh, the, the, the concept of inherence was very much inherent in the language of the time in India, in the influence of post enlightenment modes of thinking, which likes very much the things to be inside of one. So there's a lot of to consider also regarding how acharyas use words. For example, Prabhupada said, we are conditioned from time immemorial. And some people will say, okay, we don't remember when that began, but there has a beginning. It's beyond our memory. But actually he was not saying that. He, when he say immemorial, he referred beginningless. Why? Because he also referred in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and I mentioned that in the second episode, Nitya Siddhas in Golok are devotees of Krishna from time immemorial. Yeah. And of course, that means from forever, without beginning. So he used the word immemorial to indicate something without beginning, but we may have understood that differently. So in this way, <clears throat> for me, basically, we could say that the way that our contemporary chairs spoke of inheritance actually meant inherent potential. So I tried to make different cases for those points in my book in detail. But again, as you mentioned, at the end, we may even conclude saying someone may, more, may be more satisfied with that we don't know and we will never know and it's okay <laughs> and it's because okay. Not, and nonetheless it's very clear how the Goswamis presented that's that point on Siddhanta so one thing is, is separate from the other actually in one sense those should be two separate conversations whether Bhakti is inherent or not in the Jiva according to our main Shastra it's one conversation why some Acharyas seem to have said something different at some times that's another conversation. We are not just trying to prove one thing by establishing the other thing or something. Yeah. So, Maraj, uh, do you have any closing words or concluding words? Because I think we covered mostly everything. Um, <clears throat> did we cover everything or did you have any other? I mean, it's never, never possible to cover everything, but right. I think we tried our best. So sure. that's some brief, some brief recap that uh, the very foundation of my argument in, in my forthcoming book, Inherent or Inherited Back in the Jiva According to Gaudiya Vedanta. My the very foundation of my argument is not if that Back to Notaku or other Acharyas presented a circumstantial adjustment or some of my other hypotheses. My main argument rests on quoting the Goswamis, the Bhagavatam, our main Gaudiya scripture to show, to show how they unanimously 
declared that Bhakti and Prem are not inherent in the Jiva in any way. And only as a consequence of that, I have tried to harmonize whatever Bhakti Nautak or Prabhupada and other Acharyas seem to have said at, at, at the contrary at, at times, but at the same time trying to show them as aligned with our Goswamis. Because Bhakti Nautak or great personalities like Prabhupada are great authorities for me also, of course, for Sundar Gopal, but for me as well. So I have tried to honor them by deeply thinking about how to reconcile their, their statements. In, in the second part of my forthcoming book, I could have written my book and finished that in the first part by saying what the Goswamis, the Bhagavatam say on Bhakti and the Jiva, end of the book. But I chose to make a second part trying to think about how to harmonize that because of how I feel for these great personalities. And regarding Sundar Gopal's uh, points or arguments, I personally think that to concentrate almost exclusively on one single word, Shishatwa, from one single book, and mostly to explain it according to the Siddhanta of another Sampradaya, the Sri Sampradaya, and then trying to adjust whatever Bhakti Nautakur say and Jiva Goswami in connection to that is quite still weak and tenable position. Of course, he himself said he's developing his presentation and I, and I trust he will continue giving more strength to that. And of course, I totally believe in, in, in Sundar Gopal's good intention to show Bhakti Nautakur never preach up a Siddhanta. <clears throat> uh, but the point is that the, the, the fact that he considers this teleological inherence position as the actual Siddhanta, that presents a lot of Siddhantic problems that I've tried to point today. And two more thoughts, if possible. Mm -hmm. I would say that if even if Sundar Gopal or someone somehow is able to prove that Bhakti Nautakur was following Jamatri Muni and he desired to see the Sandarvas through those lands, still we find that this is not how Jiva Goswami has addressed the issue, nor others outside of our Paribar for centuries. Mm -hmm. So one of the remaining questions in this connection, I think, will be that did Bhakti Nautakur actually follow Jamatri Muni according to the Muni's actual intention, inherent Bhakti? Or did Bhakti Nautakur follow Jamatri Muni in the same way Jiva Goswami followed Jamatri Muni, as I showed by borrowing the structure of his list while establishing the non-inherence of Bhakti? And so according to what I have researched and presented, for me, it seems more the latter than the former. And actually, Bhakti Nautakur, again, is not a follower of Jamatri Muni, but a follower of the six Goswamis. <laughs> He's the seventh Goswami. And again, to conclude, even if all the hypotheses I may present in my book as to why contemporary acharyas say what they say, if, if, if everyone feels, or some of them feel, some readers are, this is unsatisfactory, still we are to recognize, <clears throat> there's place for recognizing we may not know why our acharyas say what they say, but still there is no need to research into other sampradayas like the Sri Sampradaya to receive the ultimate explanation for this topic. Because again, the Siddhant on this topic Bhakti in the Jiva has been and remains always the same. <clears throat> Bhakti is not inherent in the Jiva in any form, but we have the potential, as I mentioned, to embrace Bhakti by the grace of Bhakti itself in the form of Sadhu Sangha <clears throat> and in that way attain our highest prospect. So, something like that. Thank you, Maharaj. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> something <clears throat> I'd like to add is that we have to. Um, when, when discussing something like this, we have to be careful not to um, – because the way that I've been – you know, devotees have messaged me about you, about, oh, he's trying to do this and he's trying to do that and kind of like ad hominem attacks and things like that. I just want to say like why can't all of us – why can't we have different perspectives on on things? Like why is that – so bad and why is that so so like harmful in to some devotees like it's it's like it's like people can't uh, they, they can't like um it's it's like it's like unacceptable for some reason and what i want to say is that it's it's important that we don't um take part in like offensive mentality towards someone who might have a disagreement with us or disagreement with a or any kind of disagreement, I think it's important that we go about disagreements in a in a better way, especially over social media. Social media can just breed so much horrible, like you know, offensiveness and offensive mentalities. And um, 
I just I just want to appreciate you, Marge. Like, you're a follower of Shula Pro, but I, I I but some people don't know that. For some reason, you come off as like you're 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 not that, but you're a grand disciple of Shula Pro. Let's that's still on. Let's let 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 that sink into some devotees who want to kind of attack you for for your perspective. And I personally don't know. I haven't studied it myself. Something I appreciated what Mukunda Prabhu said was like, you should, you talking about the devotees who are reading this, you should look into this topic yourself and come to your own conclusion. This is only the perspective of someone else. Sundar Gopal Prabhu had his perspective. You have your perspective, and. It's valid. Everyone, everyone is valid in their own perspective to understand this, this, this whole topic. Um, and uh, it's a very simple point, but we need to be more uh, forthcoming. We need to be more uh, um, broad-minded, and we need to be more charitable to each other when it comes to our Vaishnava dealings. I, that's just, that's just, I just want to add that because. It's just yeah. even in the comments, I see people getting so heated about this, about this, like as if you're like trying to be offensive to the Acharyas or Srila Prabhupada or Bhakti Thakur. Like, let's all grow up a little bit. <laughs> we're all having a, we're having a discussion about it. No one is saying that, oh, you have to believe this. And that's the whole re. And if you don't believe this, then you are uh, somehow less or you're somehow uh, been, you know, um, mistaken or whatever. Anyway, rant over, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> do yes. you want to take? Do you want to? Yeah. Do you want to add yeah, something? Shula Maharaj, I over. I'm just reminded of Shula Maharaj's words: "Weak faith requires an enemy." So, it's 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 speaking again. It's, this is not about condemning anyone, but in certain stage of our development of faith, we still have not the capacity to integrate and accommodate diversity and difference of opinion. So we feel threatened by whatever seems different to what we believe in and we really feel that threatening yeah. our faith and i believe they feel that and that's why we have said better you may log off from the from the whole lecture altogether if that's feeling because yeah. if not the, the problem may be you may end feeling there is an enemy there he's attacking me or he's attacking the sampradaya well it may not be the case so yeah it's important to to acknowledge there are different degrees of faith and that's to be honored in all levels but some degrees of faith are not to be exposed with to certain topics. Uh, See, even you say, yeah, yeah, sir. Even you saying saying that, people will say, "Oh, uh, you know, he said weak faith it, it requires an enemy." That means he's saying, "Oh, I have such strong faith, and uh, you have to listen to you know." That's how people see, see that when. And anyway, this is just a dumb. It's a dumb way to 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 always look at someone who's speaking and and thinking what their intention is that I'm better than you and this and that. I don't think that's your intention. I don't. And you you can say what your intention is, but I I don't think that's your intention. I don't ever read that as your intention. But yeah, I I hope I was clear about my intention. And if I'm being yeah, a, I cheater, think you were. a cheater in, in I think you were. social media, I think Krishna himself would make the arrangement to expose me as a total cheater and being someone who <laughs> is not walking to talk. And 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 if that's the case on some level. I pray to receive that chastisement because I want to be correct and I want to have integrity and I don't want to be a cheater on any level to cheat myself. And it's so easy to fall into that. So yeah. I know everyone can fall into that so easy. So I prefer to concentrate on being disciplined and strict on myself. And if someone wants to feel that I am have bad intention and so on, I, I don't take it personally. I don't take offense. I try to take it. Okay, it's part of their process and but I, nonetheless, I will pay close attention to my intention, none, just sure. in case. <laughs> I just get triggered by, um, I just get triggered by when 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 people when devotees who don't disagree with each other they have to they they have to have like you said they have to have an enemy and they have to have something to like, you know no you know just get really hung up about something. Another th point I wanted to make was Sundar. Go one, I spoke to Sundar Gopal yesterday about you know about this through um through chat and things and he was saying that he's like he likes to he wants to kind of de-escalate this whole thing i don't feel that it's escalated in any way i think escalate's a strong word what's the meaning of the i don't know what's escalate. the meaning of the escalate means like to uh like things have become heightened like okay he made his presentation now you made your presentation now it, you're escalating it like mm -hmm. okay now this is the next point now he is 
you know, he he said he's not going to make another point about it, but he feels that if if there if there is some points to add to, then he might write something and think. I don't think there's any escalation here. I think, I think that it's just people have difference of perspective of of the way they're seeing things, and that's okay. And we don't have to have a conclusive. The G, the Goswamis might have had a conclusiveness, but we might not see it that way according to how we are looking at it, right? Interpret interpretation and things like that. So I don't think it's escalated. Just to add that in there. Well, of course, I respect whatever, however, Sundar Gopal feels about the situation and the need for certain stance. But right. I personally, I personally see this as a conversation, an ongoing, ongoing dialogue. Not so much in terms of escalating or de-escalating, but in times, in terms of developing our ideas, developing our thoughts. And that will take us to different places and moments and things. And someone will say something and some, but it's not so much about defeating each other. At least personally, I have been praying before this episode. I told you we were speaking. I say, I, I want to stop speaking now. I have to chant Japa. I want to pray before the episode. Right. <laughs> Actually, I, I've come from India some days back and I was really praying when I was in God's room, praying at Sonanda Sukha, the Kunja, the Samadhi of Bhakti Thakur to properly honor, represent him. And Srila Prabhupada's Janmastan in Calcutta to properly honor his legacy in the Samadhi of Jiva Swami in Radha Damodar Mandir. Beautiful. Because for me, this all has to do with, and I don't want to present myself as a hero or I'm so nice or something, but I'm trying to, 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 to take the situation as healthy as possible. Like I like always what Krishna says in the Gita at the end of the Gita, verse 70 of the last chapter, that he said, those who study this conversation, they worship me through their intelligence. So I really like that. I and mean, for me, studying this topic and speaking and how ongoing dialogue is to worship Bhagavan yeah. by using our faculties. This is at least my, my pursuit here, you know, which attempts to honor and protect, again, not only Jiva Goswami's legacy, but Bhakti Nautakur's and Prabhupada's legacy as well. Uh, so, so, yeah, basically, I try to see that in those terms. Did you want to take the questions like, question by question, like you were going to address them on the thread? I mean, you will... Not, sense, no, not here, I'm saying like after this oh. is done, did you want to... Or were you yeah, going to do that? I mean, if we want to address some questions here, I don't know how much we are in time, if you prefer to close here. We're whatever, at, at, way, whatever the case, I may address the questions. If we address some now, whatever remaining questions are, I, I try to, to, there's, to address there's them. There's too many. Okay. <laughs> There's way too many. And and some of them we already addressed, and some of them are highly technical. Some of them are also quite long. I just want to say I'm reading everyone's comments. I appreciate your comments, but I, I don't want to address them now. I actually have a hard stop, uh, and it's been two hours. So um, if you – Let's let's share some um, practical things here, uh, housekeeping stuff. Bhakti in the Jiva .com. This is Maharaj's new book that's coming out. It's in the stages of. Um, it's already been edited and now it's in the design phase and almost printing. Right, Maharaj? Yeah. Now layout and hopefully printed by beginning of next year, February, March. Please pray Wonderful. with me for that. <laughs> yes. So this is Maharaj's <laughs> forthcoming uh, book. It and will be you, available also a Kindle version, electronic version as well, not only hardbound, softbound. Sure. And um, there's a Facebook page for the book, facebook.com slash bhakti in the jiva. Uh, if you want to hear more from Maharaj, he has a wonderful YouTube channel, Swami Padmanabha. You can find him on YouTube. All his classes that he gives, right now he's giving Gaur Leela, in Bulgaria, he's in Bulgaria. Gora Lila, beautiful, uh, beautiful um, talks on Gora Lila, uh, and he's mm -hmm. they're coming out on YouTube every single day. Um, also, they're live on Zoom. You can contact him if you want to get on that. But they also are live on YouTube, and you can find them there. Various, various different topics about uh, Godia Siddhanta on his YouTube page. Really wonderful. I, I really recommend that. Um, Maharaj, thank you so much for joining me again. I really appreciate I really, really appreciate you coming on and you know putting your neck out there and talking about this difficult subject matter. Is this is this it now? Or are we going to uh, put a put a put a bow on it as they say in America, put a bow on this topic and and let's see. Let's see. But uh, thank you again and thank you for our listeners. And anything to add there, Marge? Oh, I, I thank you for the invitation and also sure. of course I, I'm grateful to Sundar Gopal for his presentation, which helped me to develop even more my own presentation. And again, I hope that my presentation is nourishing 
his own PhD project and also is helping the whole Gaudia community to continue this process of getting closer and closer to our acharyas and getting closer and closer to each other by proper thinking, by proper dialogue, by proper respect and, and, and affection, Gaudia affection and being considerate and affection, considerate and respectful to each other. So I appreciate the chance of expressing that here today. So thank you very much. No problem. Uh, some devotees are asking for your um, contact info. Can I can I give your email address, or yeah. do you want not not be flooded with <laughs> emails? So if if uh, you want to get in t- contact with Maharaj, his email is there: padmanabhaswami at gmail dot com. You can contact him there. Send him all your wonderful and be respectful, please, as as I've always um, tried to. Uh, illustrate here but thank you everyone for listening you can find this podcast on youtube and facebook it's going to be out on just audio pad- podcasting platforms as well this is episode 94 i'm i'm already up to um i've recorded all my up to 100 actually the 100th one will be uh i will be interviewed by um a friend uh, and so let's see that that'll be also fun but thank you everyone for joining have a great rest of your uh day and uh, thank you for listening Hare krishna maharaj please stay on Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare